There's a famous example in the world of mathematics uh, which preceded, well, almost by experiment, a lot of this study. There's a very great mathematician, in some ways perhaps the greatest of the 20th century, called Paul Edish, who died just a few years ago. He was the most prolific mathematician probably of all time. The only Euler is uh, more prolific. Uh, Edish was Hungarian, and he was so-called extraordinary professor of the Hungarian Academy, uh, who paid him to do mathematics. He had no home. All his possessions were just two suitcases, and he traveled the world with his elderly mother, and he would stay with all his collaborators and friends or in hotels, just doing mathematics. Um, he wrote probably on average about 30 research papers a year, all extraordinarily good research papers, um, in which varied from the proof of the prime number theorem to many, many other challenge problems. He had a skill for determining the difficulty of a problem, and he would offer cash prizes for the solution of the problems which he posed. And they were very finely judged. Some may be $10 problems, some may be $10,000 problems. But he rarely ever judged the difficulty wrongly. And in this way, he sort of spurred on research in number theory. And he funded the prizes from the prizes that he was awarded for uh, uh, so he used that money to, to fund these prizes. And he had so many collaborators. You know, there are all these stories that, you know, he would arrive in town. By the time he'd left the railway station, he'd already written a paper with the porter or something. <laughs> or something. Um, and uh, so sometimes at conferences, there would be this unusual structure in a hotel, rather like in a chess match, where there would be maybe 20 of his collaborators from different parts of the world that would seat themselves at different desks or, or tables and then he would move from one to the other, uh, spending maybe 15 minutes trying to attack the next part of a problem. Then he'd move on to the next collaborator and go on around. So it's like a simultaneous chess tournament uh, with him contributing to each collaboration and then, and then coming around again at the end. So because of his huge number of collaborators and uh, publications, uh, something called the Erdosh number uh, was created by mathematicians. If you had written a paper with Erdos, you had an Erdos number of one. If you had written a paper with somebody who had themselves written a paper with Erdos, you had an Erdos number of two, uh, and so on. So Robin Wilson, my predecessor, uh, has an Erdos number of one, so he once wrote a paper with Erdos. Uh, and there's a huge number of mathematicians in the world with Erdos number one, and almost everybody in the whole community has an Erdos number of sort of five or, uh, or less. So everybody's connected to Erdős through collaboration. And one way of uh, measuring uh, the distance that you are uh, in such a network, you can see it's just like the small world situation, the six degrees of separation, um, is to measure the number of nodes, the number of places uh, where there's some splitting, of extra friends as it were, and then the number of uh, links or friends uh, per node. And so the average distance that you'd expect to go in a complicated network uh, to go from any two points would be the ratio of the logarithm of the number of nodes uh, divided by the logarithm of the number of uh, links or, or friends per node. So uh, for uh, this case, uh, it's about 5.9. So even with uh, 30 uh, friends per node, and uh, the population of the world, as it were, uh, you've got 10% uh, or so of the world population uh, included. So people had understood this type of structure uh, experimentally in other situations. Well, so that just gives you a little flavor of some of these consequences of numbers like the number of people in the population, the number of people in the world, uh, and what you have to then think about if you want to have a system that identifies them or distinguishes them.